hello there and uh, thanks for joining us for this next episode in MMT Ed Q&A. Thanks to all of those who have submitted questions for us to answer. There's been many and we'll do our best to get through them all. Tonight I have a special guest to help me work through them. But first a few simple questions. From Samuel. Hello Samuel. Samuel wondered if the MMT discussions will be restricted only to YouTube and he suggests maybe we explore making them available on Spotify. We're more than happy to do that. We're looking at ways to disseminate our information more broadly and we'll look into that. Thanks Samuel. And then there was a simple question from Somjit and excuse me if I've mispronounced your name. Somjit asked, I want to read in detail about the issues discussed by Fidel Kabu. Some journal articles or books would be great help. Now he's obviously referring to last week's uh, Q&A where we had uh, Fidel Kaboob as our guest. Here's his contact details and so you can see his email there and I'm sure if you send Fidel a nice email and ask for some further information he'd be more than happy to help you. Now tonight we're going to go through four questions and I invited my colleague, MMT colleague, Professor Randall Ray from Bard College in the US to join me. And we've been longtime colleagues, uh, good friends, and sometime co-author. And the question that we started with tonight was from Andrea. And Andrea was wondering what the epistemological validity of MMT was or is compared to mainstream macroeconomics. And he wants to know where does MMT fit in the philosophy of science. So after some introductory discussion with Randy, uh, I put the question to him and this is what he had to say. It's also the way uh, that we analyze MMT too. Um, we see it as a paradigm and uh, we see uh, MMT as a paradigm shift. Um, I think a, a lot of the pieces for MMT were already there. And I, and all of the people who helped create MMT uh, brought with them a lot of ideas from other traditions, from Keynes, from Marx, from the institutionalists, and um, integrated all of those into a, a new paradigm. And um, so just to back up, the Kuhn's um, theory was that um, all scientists have to have a paradigm. You, you can't even come up with questions without a paradigm, much less try to answer the questions. So we all operate with paradigm works. Okay. And since we're talking about economics, uh, we're talking about the economic world, how the economy works. And um, the, the mainstream paradigm, and we can keep this really simple, is basically the market view that uh, the invisible hand uh, guides us to make the correct decisions. Um, <clears throat> and uh, Keynes uh, reacted against that view. Uh, there was a Keynesian revolution in the scientific sense of the term. Keynes had a completely different paradigm, a different worldview. And many people wrote about the Keynesian revolution. Uh, unfortunately, uh, it did not take. Um, and this was a, this is really a puzzle for those of us who follow Kuhn. Because if you think of moving from the view the earth is flat to moving to the view that uh, the earth is round, uh, that completely changes the way that you view the earth. Uh, moving from the view that the earth is the center of the universe uh, to the view that the Earth uh, goes around the sun is a completely different view. And normally, with scientific revolutions, you don't go back to the old one. Okay? We don't go back. I know there are some flat earthers, but we, we look at them as being completely insane. Um, but uh, in economics, the majority of the profession did go backwards. <laughs> they went back to the old views that Keynes had thoroughly discredited. Um, and so it's a puzzle that um, that revolution didn't take. 
And I know the, the questioner is wondering whether the M&T revolution will take because it is providing a new view. Of course, we think it's correct. It, it fits uh, the facts as we know them much better than the mainstream view does. Um, and normally in science, that is what wins out. Now, uh, I think Kuhn's uh, theory applies very well to the natural sciences. Uh, maybe not quite so well to the social sciences. And um, uh, it's possible that uh, we won't win out, but uh, I think that we are making progress and we've seen that when the, this global uh, pandemic hit, which became a global economic crisis hit, that uh, many policymakers who had previously been describing MT as completely insane, uh, have now embraced what they think MMT is. <laughs> they don't really get it right. Uh, but the point is that um, they, they have realized the paradigm they were using is completely wrong. And uh, they're looking for something new. Yeah, so when I studied philosophy of science, I became quite interested in the, the next iteration of Kuhn, that was from Imre Lakatos. Mm -hmm. And uh, he, he, he expanded it into some of the, and trying to answer some of those questions, he talked about degenerative paradigms. And yeah. uh, this was a paradigm that it was uh, still dominant. And we can think of that as mainstream economics, uh, but had lost what he called empirical content and uh, in other words, it was unable to explain anything that was of interest. And uh, you know, that's, when I, that's why I often use Japan as an example of uh, the inability of, because uh, you know I'm interested in data and econometrics and things like that. And uh, Japan has sort of pushed the policy parameters much more than, than other advanced countries. They've had larger deficits for longer, larger public debt for longer. And uh, so there, you know, I often think of there, that's a good, not, you know, whatever you want to call it, a test case for the mainstream propositions to see whether they have got empirical content. And of course, they, they haven't. Uh, they can't explain why interest rates are, are zero and why yields are now negative on long-term debt and why there hasn't been any inflation in Japan. And in that context, I think that uh, uh, MMT has got empirical content. So in the Lakatosian sense, uh, I think that we have got credentials to be an emerging and replacement paradigm. And then speaking of degenerative uh, science, the more, uh, at the most advanced uh, of the orthodox uh, economics doesn't even look at the real world at all. They don't even try to explain any real world phenomena. They, they are doing the equivalent of angels on pinheads. That's all they do. They never touch base with the real world. Now, as a policy maker, of course, you have to come down and touch uh, base with the real world. And so they, they use a very um, sim simple version of the mainstream theory to try to analyze it. As you say, they get it all wrong, completely wrong. Yeah, the interesting thing about that is that when you think about, say, the new Keynesian macro paradigm, which is sort of the orthodoxy, yeah. It, you know, one of the ways they usurped whatever we call the Keynesian sort of consensus in the 60s was to say that, well, Keynes, the, the, the notions of Keynes were uh, built on the assumption that humans were irrational. And of course, you know, money illusion, all of that stuff. And uh, of course, humans aren't irrational because a priori the mainstream claim they're not. And uh, so there's all that micro foundations literature that uh, now the problem, you know, when you take that into the new Keynesian era, they make a big thing of being micro founded. In other words, they believe that it's some sort of scientific credibility that 
that uh, they're basing their extrapolations and their predictions on the basis of what they call grounded human behaviour, rationality and thing, you know, maximisation, which none of the social psychologists or sociologists would buy anyway, but that's a separate story. But of course, when they run their econometric models, they, those simple propositions that they use to derive their mathematical results uh, can't generate a, a, a statistical model that, that has any relationship with the data. And so then they, from an econometric point of view, they then fudge that and add a few extra variables. And as soon as they do that, they've they've lost any pretension to be micro-founded because the, the models they come out to try to fit the data with can't be derived from their micro-principles. And I've always been amused by why they, they don't see that. It's ad hoc. Ad hoc's the word. So, Andrea, I hope that answers your question. Uh, both Randy and I are confident that uh, MMT is a... Uh, a viable paradigm, uh, a viable uh, lens, as I call it, a framework for understanding, and uh, uh, we'll see what the future holds. So, Randy, the second question was from, and it's a, quite a different question altogether, it's from Enrico, and he asks, uh, would you necessarily need to raise taxes to implement Medicare for all? Could abolishing the income tax be feasible if you offset it with another tax? So this is an American-centric question and uh, you know more about that than I do. Yeah, so I guess first we better describe what Medicare for All is. Medicare for All would be a health system much more like what every other rich developed country has, where you take, you provide health care to everybody. Um, and essentially it's public spending. We don't have that in the U.S. except for people over age 65. So that is our Medicare program. And the proposal, which was pushed by Bernie Sanders and others, progressives, uh, is to extend that to everybody so that everyone would get what seniors in the U.S. now get, which is publicly funded health care. So just, right. so, just so that yeah. uh, the international <laughs> Uh, audience can understand. Joe Biden doesn't support that, does he? He has not. He, yes, he uh, has been supporting private insurance. Right. So most Americans have to pay for private health insurance. If they're employed, their employer typically pays about half. But it's very expensive, very inefficient, and it leaves, uh, I think, st still we had 30, 40 million people with no coverage at all, which means they have to pay out of their pocket and uh, they can be turned away from doctors and hospitals and so on. Okay. Uh, so anyway, extending it to everyone. And uh, so would we have to increase taxes? Uh, the way to look at this from the MMT perspective is that taxes don't pay for programs. Uh, if we provided uh, Medicare for all, would that increase resource demand so much that we need to reduce resource demand somewhere else to avoid inflation pressure? So it's a question about whether we have the resource capability to provide health care to everyone in the United States. And so what do we actually mean by resource cap capability? Yeah, well, I don't mean money. I mean the real doctors, hospitals, medicine, ambulances, all of that kind of stuff. And if you compare the US use of real resources, not money, real resources, uh, we use about twice as many resources as the next closest rich country does. And uh, we're close to 20% of GDP. Most rich countries are around 10%. Uh, Japan, I think, is about 8%. And we have the worst outcome of any country. That's <laughs> we spend twice as much, and we get worse results. So, uh, and a, a big part of that is because of the private health insurance system. That is a big part of our inefficiency. 
So in other words, if we went to Medicare for all, we probably would reduce total resource use by a very conservative estimate saving would be about 3%. A uh, say a longer term view, getting us more like every other rich country, uh, means we would save about ten percent of GDP. So somewhere between three and ten. Uh, that means we're going to be releasing resources, not demanding more resources. We actually uh, moving to Medicare for all. We we might find that resources are becoming unemployed because we're saving so many resources by moving to a more efficient system. And if that's true, the answer is no, you cut taxes. You don't raise taxes as you implement. Now, there, the transition can be difficult. Uh, some of the resources you release, people who work in the private health insurance sector are not going to be well trained to move into a public, uh, publicly provided healthcare system. Uh, and so they may need retraining and so on. So uh, I, I think that the 10% the number is probably way too high. The 3% savings number is probably about right. I don't see any scenario in which we're gonna need to raise taxes to release more resources than we already will be releasing. Uh, as we move into uh, Medicare for all. So, so why don't the deficit hawks see that? They, well, I mean, they, they are focused on dollars. They're focused on the money that is being spent. And uh, they make, some of them, I mean, it's such a simple mistake. You would think that they would catch it, but they don't catch it. They just add on the estimated cost of Medicare for all to the system we already have. So they say, we're already at 20%. We add Medicare for all, we're going to go to 25, 27, 28% of GDP, which of course makes no sense whatsoever. We're going to be saving resources, uh, not adding on Medicare for all to what we already have. That would be crazy. And we're not going to do it. Given a choice, everyone will eventually dump their private insurance. Everyone will. Uh, Bernie wanted to make it mandatory, get rid of the private health insurance. And there were political reasons for that. Uh, but given a choice, everyone will do it eventually. I mean, it may take a year, it may take a few years, but uh, they will see the advantages of doing that. So anyway, uh, that's one of the reasons. And then the other is just, okay, under the current system, Private firms and households pay about one third of the cost. And uh, so we will be shifting more spending to the federal government. And so uh, the deficit hawks are just purely looking at the federal government's budget and uh, more spending uh, without raising taxes. Now, uh, for reasons we could talk about uh, with respect to one of the other questions. It's very hard to predict what will happen to the deficit. Okay, but they automatically assume the deficit will get bigger. That may not be true at all uh, because the deficit outcome is, we say, endogenous to the economy. Uh, it's impossible to really predict what will happen to total government spending and total tax revenue uh, once we have this kind of a reform, because it's such a huge reform for our whole economy. Yeah. Uh, but that's what they focus on. And that's so what, what, about, what about the issue then if, uh, if the private expenditure that's currently tied up in these uh, rent-seeking arrangements from insurance companies and the pharmaceutical companies and all the rest of it that's sort of uh, inflating the healthcare overall health care expenditure, it may well be that the federal government's, the total outlay doesn't, doesn't fall, but, but uh, federal government spending goes up in net terms, might be, you don't know. But what about the savings of the, the, the diversion of health spending on private sector to other things? Wouldn't that be an issue? Well, I, so first, 
if you compare the United States, so as I said, we spend about twice as much. Uh, and maybe half of that is because we spend more for the same services. So we, we spend uh, much more for the drugs, uh, pharmaceuticals. Uh, our, uh, we spend much more on the doctors. And um, there are complicated reasons for this. Uh, for example, doctors in the United States have very high uh, malpractice insurance. Uh, because they're sort of little for-profit firms and uh, they're afraid of being sued. Um, other countries don't have that. So our doctors have to make a lot more money because they have to pay these high insurance rates. So we have lots of effic inefficiencies built into the system that uh, uh, are inflationary. Okay? Because we spend so much more, our drug costs and healthcare costs are increasing very rapidly. So we have inflation pressure from that. And we will be reducing the prices of all of that stuff and reducing the rate of increase of those prices. And yes, people might be spending more in other uh, places. I expect that firms, when they don't have to pay such high uh, health insurance costs for their employees, might give workers uh, better, other kinds of benefits maybe more vacation time, paid vacation. You know, we have no law that mandates paid vacation in the United States at all. Right. And a lot of workers don't get any at all. So if employers didn't have to spend so much on health insurance, we might have some paid vacation time. Right. Um, so on net, I don't believe that we're gonna get inflation from that extra spending, but I think we will have better lives. Uh, so, Enrico, I think I hope that answers your question. And it's a really interesting segue, I think, into the next question from Rory. And this is a, 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 a was a complex question, but basically he's really concerned about the political flexibility in the realm of taxes and spending. He posits that uh, uh, MMT believes that you can uh, adjust uh, net spending, in other words, spending and taxation at the federal level within relation to so-called inflationary limits. And he's wondering whether uh, if you did have an inflationary episode, then, then that would imply that governments would need to be able to quickly raise taxes or curtail spending uh, to curtail those uh, pressures. So his question really is, uh, what's the practicality of that and wouldn't it be better just to uh, allow the predictable annual expenditure to be close to tax levels which he says uh, would not be drastically different to systems in place in many countries today so it's really about how to deal with rent seekers and the whole political thing what have you got to say about that do you reckon yeah there are a whole bunch of issues there so um First, what MMT advocates is uh, relying on automatic stabilizers rather than uh, relying on discretionary uh, tax hikes when inflation occurs or tax reductions. <clears throat> so, and there also was a, a question, maybe it was the previous one and we didn't do it, on uh, the income tax. Uh, whether we can replace the income tax with another kind of tax. Yeah, that's right. So let me just say one good thing about the income tax. <laughs> one good thing about the income tax is that it's pro-cyclical. So when incomes are booming, uh, the tax rates go up with a progressive income tax. And the total tax revenue, which is withdrawing demand out of the economy, goes up. In the United States, it's really incredible. Uh, how fast tax, federal tax revenue grows. But can I just clarify one thing there? When, when you say it's pro-cyclical, that means it moves with the state of the economy, but, but the tax rates don't change. It's just that the revenue changes. That's the point. It's not the tax rates that are pro-cyclical. It's the revenue take that's pro-cyclical. Yes. Yeah. Or, so it, tax revenue goes up for two reasons. One is 
if they're taking 20% of your income and your income goes up, you're still paying 20% on the higher amount, but also you get pushed up into higher tax brackets. Yeah. So progressive tax, maybe your tax rate goes from 20 to 25%. Uh, and in, in the U.S., this is very important, especially at the higher income levels, uh, where uh, in, income in a boom really, really booms. <laughs> <laughs> bonuses the high income people get our tax rates will will grow at an annual pace of above 20 percent per year think about how fast uh, tax revenue is growing in a boom and on the other hand in a recession uh and the coronavirus pandemic when it hit tax revenue just disappears um, and so our tax system is already extremely cyclical it takes out demand in a boom, and it takes less out in a slump. So it already does what you want it to do. Uh, now, mostly we rely on the spending side, uh, MMT, uh, uh, the MMT proposal for a job guarantee. So that also acts, this time it's counter cyclical. In bad times, you spend more on the job guarantee. In good times, you spend less. So that makes spending also very uh, counter cyclical. And you add those two things together and you really don't have to worry about what the, the questioner is worrying about. That in a boom, you're gonna get too much demand and it's gonna cause inflation. If you have an income tax, especially a progressive one, and you have a job guarantee, you're gonna put in and take out demand exactly like you want to do and you don't have to uh, the political uh, will uh, to do the right thing quick enough. So are you suggesting that there's never a reason for the government to take a discretionary fiscal contraction, in other words, cut spending or increase taxes and or increase taxes when there's an inflationary I, episode? I would say the in um, normal times no uh now if you're going to uh, a major war world war ii or you're going to implement a full-scale uh green new deal which is very in terms of spending a, a very similar uh sort of impact on the economy you need to plan ahead so i'm not against planning uh and so we advocate as we implement the Green New Deal, uh, it may be necessary to impose a tax to take some demand out. Uh, we actually prefer postponed consumption. So we're gonna give it back to you. We're gonna put a temporary surcharge on uh, wages in order to reduce demand during the phase in of the Green New Deal. And then we're gonna give it back to you in the form of maybe uh, better benefits, uh, better retirement, and so on, uh, later as um, the economy is ramped up. So no, I'm not saying you, you never want to do it. Uh, the coronavirus is a very good example of uh, a time when we needed to ramp up uh, fiscal stimulus. We haven't done nearly enough. But also you have to remember, we don't have a job guarantee. So, so we're we're not in any sense prepared for dealing with massive job loss and in the United States. We, we uh, most people lose their jobs, don't even get unemployment compensation. So in the United States, it requires an act of Congress to deal with a downturn, which is crazy. It's a crazy way to run your economy where you have to have an act of Congress. You have to get Republicans and Democrats together to deal with something that could be dealt with if you had in place a job guarantee, it would be automatic. I mean, I've often argued that um, recurrent spending, that spending on things that are, the services that are exhausted within 12 months, they're difficult for governments to adjust quickly because they're pensions and uh, schools and uh, pencils and you know, all the things that really have a high visibility in a political sense and also impact very directly on our daily lives. But that uh, 
uh, uh, capital spendings where typically where austerity is imposed because politically they can get away with it without the people seeing that the bridges are decaying. But I've often thought that in a progressive planning forward thinking type environment, and the Japanese have done this historically, that you have a, a range of uh, the, you know, the jargon is the shovel ready projects. You have a range of projects that are modular, they're capital public infrastructure projects that are modular that can be that, that, that are all designed and planned uh, with the you know, current technology, etc., but can be switched on or off relatively quickly if you need to adjust spending. And those sort of projects have very little political consequences in the short run anyway. So um, th that's the way I've always thought about the ability to get around those type of constraints if you need to. And if you have the job guarantee in place, then you can you can set some number. When employment in the job guarantee program increases above 50 million, that's the time you need some major public infrastructure to pull some of those workers out. Now there were some other questions relating to inflation, but I think we'll deal with them another day. The, the last question, and this is a US centric question too, but I think it has, it's relevant to everywhere. And, and this is from Fabio. And he asked, when a government's annual budget gets approved by Congress, so it's US Congress, I guess he's referring to, is it legally mandated that the deficit gets covered by the issuance of interest bearing treasury notes? And so really he's wondering about whether it's an administrative issue or a, a, a political issue or whether it's somehow embedded in your constitution or however. Okay, uh, let me say yes and no. Okay, because uh, when the Federal Reserve, which is our central bank, was created in 1913, there were some provisions put in the Federal Reserve Act. And one of the provisions is that uh, the Fed is not allowed to um, directly buy bonds from the Treasury or provide uh, overdrafts. So that's now, a piece of legislation now, isn't it? It's a law. Yeah. The Federal Reserve Act, which has been amended many times and has been, uh, even that part has been amended at uh, some point during wars, it's been very typical, where uh, this provision is set aside and um, the, the Fed is directed to um, uh, function to allow the Treasury to spend uh, without going to bond markets. Uh, and so that periodically this is suspended. But in, in normal times, um, the uh, Treasury needs to get uh, positive credits to its deposit account at the Fed. It's a very silly thing, uh, but it is in the Federal Reserve Act. It can be changed at any point by Congress. Congress could say, you know, that's a, that's a silly idea. Why not just credit the Treasury's account and, and let them uh, go forward with spend? But right now, the Treasury needs to get funds into its account. Beyond some very small limit, the Treasury needs to sell bonds in the issue market. Uh, and then it can transfer funds from a private bank to the Fed. And uh, then it can uh, write the check. I mean, most banks are electronic now, not, not with physically uh, uh, issuing checks. But anyway, the, uh, the Fed can turn around and immediate, like, immediately repurchase all of those bonds. Uh, and uh, so ultimately they end up on the Fed's balance sheet anyway. So they repurchase them in the secondary bond market though? They, they buy them in the secondary bond market. So first they sell it to a private bank and then the Fed buys it. Yeah. You, you could skip the private banks altogether. You could sell them directly to the treasury, I mean to the Fed, or you could just say, uh, just allow overdrafts. Okay, I mean, any of those options 
would eliminate the, the middleman, which is the, the special dealer banks. Um, and all of this is completely uh, within the purview of Congress to, to do it any time that it wants to. And the thing that most people don't understand, and, and I often get asked this question, is that that little piece of gymnastics between the primary issue to the, to the authorised dealers and then the, the QE, whatever you want to call it, in the, where the Federal Reserve Bank or the central bank in the general sense buys in the secondary bond market, delivers a, an instant capital gain to the to the original holders anyway so it's sort of like it's it's it's, it's a double whammy really that it's both unnecessary but a, a little bit of extra corporate welfare out there and you know this is why the people who worry oh what if the bond markets won't buy the bonds that's never going to happen because the special dealer banks want to be in these markets okay for the reasons that you just uh explained they want to be in the markets and to remain in, to, to remain a dealer bank, they must always place bids. Yeah. Yeah, and we dealt with we no chance whatsoever that the bonds are not gonna sell. We dealt with that in the episode one last week where where I talked a bit about bid to cover ratios and you know this the, the, the volume of bids in the primary issue relative to how much is being asked by the government and doomsayers are always saying oh the bid collapsed down well below one which meant which would mean there wouldn't be enough uh, uh, people wanting to buy the issue and uh, of course the empirics are exactly the opposite and, and they're rising at the moment again okay well thanks Randy for your time and I uh, hope uh, that our questionnaires uh, Andrea Enrico and Rory and Fabio uh, were satisfied and uh, Thanks very much, Randy. Take care. Thanks. Well, that's uh, Randy Ray, Professor Randy Ray. I hope you found that interesting. And uh, many thanks to Randy for giving up his time. Randy will be back probably in September offering some courses in MMT Ed. So look out for that. We'll be announcing that fairly soon. So that's for another week. Uh, next week I'll have another guest and some more questions. If you can help us, we only exist through donations. The program that we're building and the infrastructure and the capacity is not cheap. It's fairly labour intensive and we really can only expand the scale if we get further financial support. We thank all of those so far that have given us some financial assistance and we need more if you can help. Please help if you can. So that's it, and good night, and we'll see you next week.